I'd like to um, welcome everybody that's here as our guest tonight, and especially Mr. Schumann. Um, I was going to recap his um, bio today, and then I realized that I couldn't say it any better than this. So I'm going to read it to you if you don't mind. Michael is an economist, an attorney, an author, an entrepreneur. His books, The Small Mart Revolution, How Local Businesses Are Beating the Global Competition, and Going Local, Creating Self-Reliant Communities in the Global Age, are considered essential reading for social entrepreneurs. Michael has worked with communities throughout the world to create more sustainable local economies. Most recently, he led the Community Food Enterprise Project, which was jointly funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. I'd like to welcome you. Well, uh, very nice to be with you, and uh, I, I'm appreciative of the fact that you folks have so much work to do that um, I have to run through some things in about 20 minutes. So that's what I'm going to try to do. But tomorrow we've got a lovely luncheon uh, where we're going to get into things in a little more detail. So if people are interested, please come back to that luncheon. Um, what I wanted to do is just sort of lay the framework for the work uh, that uh, I'm going to be doing uh, with the council here. And uh, I've called this Revitalizing Cabarrus County from the Inside Out a Serious Stimulus Strategy, um, because I think we desperately need some serious stimulus here. And I thought where I would begin is uh, sharing with you a story about a delicatessen in Ann Arbor, Michigan, called Zingerman's. Zingerman started as a very modest delicatessen, um, did well for about 10 years, and they decided that they wanted to grow. Um, they thought about becoming a chain like Schlotsky's, and they said, you know, we really don't want to do that for two reasons. One is, is that we pride ourselves on our quality control, and we're going to lose that. The other is, is that we really enjoy coming to work every day because of all the relationships we have with our community. So they decided that rather than growing wide, they would grow deep. And the way to grow deep was to think about other businesses they could create within the framework of Zingerman's. So for example, they looked at things coming into the deli and they said, well, we serve bread. So they created a bakery. They serve coffee, so they created a coffee roasting company. Uh, they have uh, cheese and ice cream, so they created a creamery. And then they looked at things coming out of the delicatessen. For example, they have great food. Why not create a sit-down restaurant called The Roadhouse? And they have great cakes. They could create a mail-order business. They also have great technical service and customer how, how one treats customers properly, so they created a whole consultancy called Zingtrain. In all, this delicatessen grew into nine independent businesses. And these independent businesses have partners that <coughs> license the name. They meet every week for quality control purposes. Together, they hire about 550 people in Ann Arbor, and their annual sales are over $30 million. Now what's interesting about the Zingerman story is that they built a cluster from scratch. They didn't look for strengths of food in the community. They said, you know what? We see a gap, a big hole in our community, and we're going to fill that hole with a whole set of food-related businesses. And that philosophy is a philosophy that could be a tremendous job creator in the region here. So I have this picture here of the late, great Jane Jacobs, who's in some ways the intellectual architect of many of, of the ideas that are in this strategy. But I call this strategy LOIS. LOIS stands for Locally Owned and Import Substituting Development. Locally owned businesses means that the majority of the owners of a business actually reside in the community, in this case in the county. Import substitution means basically if you can deliver 
cost-effective goods and services in local businesses, it doesn't make sense to import them. Because every time you import things unnecessarily, you give away important pieces of your economy. Now, I want to just say why both of these things matter. This study is a fairly classic study. It was done in 2002 in Austin, Texas. It looks at $100 spent at a local bookstore versus $100 spent at a Borders bookstore. $100 spent at the Borders left $13 in the local economy. $100 spent at the local bookstore left $45. So roughly speaking, you buy the same book at the same price from the local bookstore and you get three times the jobs, three times the income and the wealth effects, three times the tax effects, three times the charitable contributions. We're not talking about small degrees of difference. Why was there this difference? Well, the Borders did not have a high-level management team on the ground. The local bookstore did. The Borders didn't use local business services. The local bookstore did. The Borders didn't advertise on local radio and TV. The local bookstore did. The Borders didn't have profits coming into the community. The local bookstore did. You generalize, and you would realize that it would be a very unusual comparison between two similar businesses, one local with local relationships and one non-local, where you would get the higher economic multiplier from the non-local business. And in point of fact, there have been about two dozen studies done in this country and abroad comparing local versus non-local businesses. And they find that typically, per dollar spent in those businesses, they generate between two to four times as many jobs in the communities. The average being two and a half times. And you can see the recent studies here in the US, in Austin, Maine, Chicago, Toledo, Iowa, San Francisco, Phoenix, Grand Rapids, New Orleans. Put another way, there is not a single study that shows otherwise. This is, this is so uniformly now proven. Um, it, uh, in my view, it is not even controversial anymore. Self-reliance. Why does self-reliance matter? Well, I thought I would give you a food example, given the foodies who are here tonight. Uh, I just finished a study several months ago that I did for Metro Cleveland. Uh, I did this with two other individuals under commission from the Cleveland Foundation. And we looked at the impact of a 25% shift in food production toward local food in a 16-county region around Cleveland. And what we found was that a 25% shift in Metro Cleveland would create 27,000 new jobs, enough in principle to employ one out of eight unemployed people in Metro Cleveland. 10,000 of those jobs would be farmers, 5,000 would be retailers, 4,000 in processors, which are high-wage jobs, 8,500 in indirect jobs. Also, many of those are high-wage jobs. 27,000 new jobs means a billion dollars of new wages, $4 billion of new output each year, $126 million of additional state and tax revenues. Now, there were a bunch of other things that we documented as benefits to come out of this. Um, reduction in unemployment payments, um, improvements in environmental protection, improvements in public health and reduction in obesity and type 2 diabetes, changes in Cleveland's image from Vernon Cuyahoga to, say, Iron Chef Michael Simons. These are all very real benefits that come through self-reliance in just one thing. Now, what I am suggesting is that there is enormous potential in moving toward greater self-reliance in this region. And I want to be clear about something. Self-reliance does not mean you give up any of your export businesses whatsoever. Continue doing everything you're doing already. But in addition to that, move toward substituting for the things that you import with new or expanded local businesses. So here's some data around your economy. 
In 2008, the county had 63,000 employees and had 12,000 self-employees. The unemployment rate in March 2011 was 8,142. And I do want to say that you folks have, you know, from, from what I can see in the data over the last year, you've made some real progress on this, that that number actually was almost 2,000 people higher a year ago. Now, I have a calculator um, on the website of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, and I work half-time for Bali, which is a national organization, and half-time for Cutting Edge Capital, which is a consultancy. Our calculators basically look at your economy and compare it to the national economy and makes calculations about what kinds of jobs, how many jobs would be available if you achieved total self-reliance. Now, you're never going to achieve total self-reliance, so this is a little bit of a so-called Gedanke experiment. But nevertheless, what it shows is that there are 28,292 potential jobs in your county's economy by substituting for imports. Now, I want to point out something um, else about that, because those are direct jobs. If we took into account multiplier benefits, that number probably will be about double. And one of the things that I will do is using Implan actually calculate what the additional jobs could be. Now, of course, again, you're not going to get to 50,000 new jobs through self-reliance. But suppose you got 10% of the way there, or 20% of the way there. It would knock out unemployment in this county. So we're not talking, again, about small potatoes of difference here. The difference between what you have now and a full employment economy is taking self-reliance seriously through locally owned businesses. And I just wanted to give you, you know, some specific examples of the kinds of leakages, economic leakages, that are revealed by the Bali calculator. Um, and you can see, you know, just sort of working our way up this list here, that there, you know, there is a need for more local dentists, uh, electric power distribution, family services, software companies, engineering services, computer programming, supermarkets, um, commu uh, commercial banking, colleges. Now, again, these are all based on national averages. Um, and, you know, if you look at any of these numbers, you say, oh, yeah, well, we probably get a lot of these things in Charlotte, or we get a lot of these things, you know, somewhere in the state, and that's probably true. But the further away you're getting these things, the more you're losing the economic impact and the value and the jobs that can come through these things. <coughs> Bali also has a food leakage calculator where we, you know, just try to take some basic commodities and, and, and see how self-reliant you are with your local production. So, again, looking at the county, um, you know, you, you are uh, way over self-reliance in poultry and eggs. Um, thank you, Tyson and Purdue. But look at, you know, in everything else, beef, uh, you're, you're, you know, 8,300 head of cattle short. Um, pork, you know, uh, this is a great pork state, but you're still, you know, you're consuming 61,000 more pigs worth of bacon than you, cons than you are making. Um, there's a need for another 6,900 milk cows. And, you know, you're practically doing nothing with your self-reliance on fruits and vegetables. Enormous amount of expansion is possible there. Now, I have a whole strategy on how a community can expand locally owned import substituting businesses. And it comes down to six Ps, planning, people, partners, purse, purchasing, and policy making. By planning, I mean we analyze where all the leaks are and we figure out what is a strategy for plugging as many of those leaks as possible. 
People means nurturing a new generation of Lois entrepreneurs. Partners means building relationships among local businesses so they are more competitive working together than they would be working apart. Purse means how do we take various kinds of streams of money, whether in banks or in pension funds, and bring those into local businesses. Purchasing means local first, buy local, and policy making. You know, I have a very modest objective for public policy, which is simply try to remove biases that might exist in public policy against locally owned businesses. Um, one, one of the things that we, we were talking about before we began is that many states, for example, will slap sales taxes onto local businesses, but not onto interstate internet businesses. And this is, you know, I mean, it's a very dumb policy because it hurts your local retailers um, at the expense, and it favors the out-of-state Amazon kinds of companies, which are least connected with the well-being of your economy. One of the things that I tr will try to put forward in the work that I do with folks here is emphasize a concept I call meta-businesses. I believe that economic development, whether it is under, you know, undertaken by a private organization or by the government or just by you and I as kind of grassroots groups, um, that economic development should pay for itself that economic development should not be reliant on big chunks of money coming from foundations or government year in, year out. And it can be self-reliant if we think about creating self-financing businesses. So I want to just give you some examples. Actually, let's go back here. This picture here is a coupon book that comes out of Bellingham, Washington. They have a business alliance with almost 1,000 local businesses Bellingham, by the way, is uh, about two-thirds the size of your county uh, in terms of population. They have, they have a local economy organization that self-finances that employs 10 people full-time. Okay? One of the things that they do that is able to finance itself is a coupon book. So they sell a coupon book with advertisements from you know, nearly 1,000 local businesses. This is also the best-selling book in the local bookstore. It contains coupons of about $10,000 if you were to use all of them. And the fact that this coupon book is, you know, does pretty much self-finance is an interesting model. And if we really demand of economic development policies that they become self-financing, it's possible. So I want to give you just some other examples of things that I've been um, exploring with communities around the country. Um, if you're interested in self-financing entrepreneurship, we have many good designs out there of self-financing business incubators. If you're interested in building networks of local businesses that finance themselves, you can create procurement cooperatives so that as a group of businesses, you buy things ranging from green power to paper, and as a collective of local businesses, you thereby bring down the costs of doing business. There's a whole bunch of self-financing um, tools related to capital. Uh, I'm actually working on a new book right now on local capital. And one of the kickers of this book, which I'll elaborate a little bit tomorrow, is the importance of creating local stock markets and helping small businesses that are very promising become publicly traded issues within a state and then creating liquid markets for people to buy and sell those securities. And each of those acts actually can be deployed on a commercial basis. In terms of local purchasing, I mean, many, many ideas out there for creating meta-businesses, but one would be, say, a local gift card. Um, all of these things still require some money to get up and running. And so I 
at the end of the day, I come back to capital. I think capital is critically important. And I just thought, you know, there's one other calculator that Bali has that is pretty useful. And that is calculating what are the financial resources, short term and long term, sloshing around in this community. So let's just do a quick survey. By show of hands here, how many people bank at a local bank or credit union? Okay. And by show of hands here, how many people have your pension funds in local business? Okay, two people. Um, now, the truth is that we have as a country about $30 trillion in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, pension funds. Half of our economy is local small business, and almost none of that long-term money is going into local business. You have, in terms of your short and long-term savings, 18, is that right there? Yes, 19, 19 billion dollars of money here. 19 billion dollars. In theory, about half of that money should be going into local business because about half your economy is local small business. I can assure you that probably the number is closer to one to five percent. So how one taps into these streams of capital that exist in your savings accounts and exist in your pension accounts is critical on how we finance a major transition in the economy here. Which brings me then to, you know, my assignment is to create a five-year plan for trying to expand local small business in this county. Uh, we're going to be doing a more in-depth leakage analysis. The Bali analysis is pretty superficial. Uh, we're going to be doing a SWOT analysis. What are the strengths and weaknesses of your economy and how can we tap into the strengths in order to find the assets for new and expanded local business? I'm particularly interested in home-based businesses because home-based businesses we know almost nothing about. And they are, it is one of the most rapidly expanding sectors in the economy in the United States and certainly here. Um, it is where many people who are on marginal incomes are working. It's where the elderly increasingly find themselves. It's where young people find themselves. And I believe that those three categories are among the most important entrepreneurship categories out there. So we're going to do interviews to find out what's going on in those sectors. We're going to look carefully at public policy and see all of the ways that public policy might be improved for supporting local small business. And then we're going to develop a meta-business list. We're going to try to prioritize what are the most promising self-financing programs that can help get us from here to there in an affordable way. There's going to be a lot of data gathering. Some of the data gathering is going to be through focus groups with the chamber, with the EDC, with the community college, with a bunch of business networks in the county. And then a lot of in-depth interviews that uh, I intend to take with small business people, home-based business people, policy leaders, and anyone else you think is important to put in the mix. I should say that in order for this to work, all of you folks have to be helpful. Now, in a way, most of the responsibility falls on this side of the room, but I think even on this side of the room, you know, food is such a big piece of what we're doing. I do hope you folks, you know, can get yourselves involved in some ways in this. And among the things that I really need from you is for you to just dump any interesting material on me that you think should be included in this plan. Um, I don't have the ability to, you know, kind of do the on-the-ground research. You folks know where all of those nuggets of information are. Um, you folks are also responsible for public meetings on how to present these ideas and when to present these ideas and who to present these ideas to. Um, I'm going to be preparing a study, but it's up to you to figure out if you want to publish it, how you want to publish it. Uh, media outlets, uh, how do we want to communicate with the press, TV, others, that's up to you. 
and next steps. I mean, I'm going to make some very concrete suggestions about what next steps ought to be, but I want a lot of feedback to sort of guide what seems practical and appropriate for this particular area. Um, I think it is deadly to come up with a study with a to-do list of 100 items. So if we can come up with like two or three critically important things to do um, once the study is done, I think that's, that's where I really would like this to wind up. All right, thank you. Thank you.